him. So we're happy to have this esteemed panel that Tiffany is going to uh, introduce to uh, Tiffany. Uh, we thank you so much for bringing these brothers together. And uh, I know Andrew, but I don't know these other brothers, but I read their bios and I'm highly impressed. So uh, Tiffany, uh, please uh, introduce our esteemed panel we got scheduled for tonight. First, I wanted to also let people know that this is We Are Here Lit, a literacy space for young, um, for black boys and young black men. And this space is basically to build a virtual community for students, parents, guardians, people in the publishing industry, educators, um, community advocates, researchers, and policymakers to support collaborative and accessible literacy initiatives to empower black boys and young black men. So I really wanted to be sure that we forefronted that so you know why we're doing this initiative. Um, so today we're gonna talk about um, black males and um, children's literature. And I wanted to introduce our guests, uh, our panelists. The first one I want to introduce is Michael Threeds. He grew up in Solano County, California. He earned his MLIS from San Jose State University in 2018. He um, has worked for Solano County Library since 2013. He's worked as a children's librarian and now is currently a digital community librarian. And his main duties include monitoring and editing the library's website, social media, and other forms of digital marketing. So if you can give us a wave, you can see Mike. Thank you, Michael. And now we have also have Mr. John Light, who um, is known as Mr. John. He's an author, storyteller, librarian, genealogist. He's from Richmond, but now lives in um, beautiful Savannah, Georgia. He received his bachelor's degree in history at Old Dominion and got his master's degree in Syracuse. Mr. John has published four books and has performed as a storyteller many times with young people. Um, and he loves to empower others um, to discover who they are through books, stories, and family. And next on the list, we have Mr. Billy who is a librarian who is focused on youth services. Um, he is currently the uh, youth services supervisor at North Regional Library at Broward County. He is also the founder of Three King Vision, an educational story time platform. This platform features uh, the YouTube show, Storytime Adventures with Mr. Billy. If you have not seen it, you must put that um, on, on your schedule to see. And um, Mr. Billy is a proud uh, alumni graduate of two HBCUs, Lincoln University and North Carolina Central. And then we have our esteemed um, Andrew Seku Jackson, who's here with us. Uh, Mr. Jackson was the executive director of Queens Library, the Langston Hughes um, Community Library and Cultural Center for 36 years. He is um, the past, one of the past presidents of Black Caucus of the American Library Association nationally um, from 2004 to 2006. He chairs the BCALA Affiliates um, Committee. He earned his um, business administration degree from York College, MLS, um, from the Graduate School of Library and Information Studies at Queens College. He is an adjunct professor um, in Black Studies and Cultural Diversity. He teaches library science at Queens College Library School of Library and Information Studies. Been doing that since 2007. And most notably, he's also the recipient of a Bronze Star Medal for his service in Vietnam. And uh, also given several um, African names for his commitment to teaching and sharing African history and culture. So we just wanna say thank you. If you can give a wave, uh, Mr. Seku, so everybody, there you go. So um, that's our panelists, and I guess I'm going to get started. If you could please uh, make sure that your mics are off, and uh, we'll get started asking questions. And I think what I'd like to do is kind of go back to the very beginning because we can't understand who we are unless we go back to the beginning. So I wanted to ask the panelists, what were your reading experiences like growing up? Being, being the old man of the group, the grandfather of all this, all of you, uh, let me add to say that uh, one of the things that's not in my bio that I keep forgetting to add, but should be added is that I am now a member, since I retired, I've been appointed to the Board of Trustees at Queens Library. Um, so I'm the first librarian 
and the first former staff person of Queens Library to serve on the Board of Trustees. And this is my fourth year as a, as a trustee. So I'm still active and have my fingertips and my fists involved in the movement and the, and the, and the work that we do as librarians. Um, my, my introduction to reading, my mother is a teacher, my sister's a teacher, and I was surrounded by teachers all my life. Uh, my mother, I'm, I'm, I'm the oldest of a set of triplets. So when we were kids, my mother enrolled us in the book of the month club. And every month we got books. I still got my Roy Rogers book from when I was a kid. Uh, and I still have my Robin Hood book when I was a kid. We had to read. And not only do we have to read the books as a teacher, we had to write book reports about what we read. And we had to discuss around the dinner table on Sundays what we were reading and why we thought these books were important. So the whole analysis of reading it and really not just scanning and say, oh, it was a good reader. I enjoyed the book. It was a lot of activities. You had to really talk about what the book was about. So that was my introduction to reading. As opposed to going to the library, we actually built our library at home. So it was always material to read around the house. And having a mother as a teacher always meant that you had to deal with things as from the teacher perspective and not just as the kid that was reading the book. Up on and panelists. Well, uh, my introduction to reading uh, was kind of funny. I'm, I'm an avid basketball junkie. So my mother would order a lot of Sports Illustrated, Slam Basketball magazines. And I grew up on hip hop. My parents were hip hop junkies. So my mom was ordering the Jet magazines, the Source magazines. So I was always infused of reading about the current events in the hip hop community and in sports. But I thought it was funny. My very first book I can vividly remember was when I was in the third grade, and it was from Scholastic, and it was a book based on the show of Family Matters. So I was reading all about Urkel. So, uh, you know, that was like some of the most vivid memories with me, and they always stuck with me because my mother always made me read to my sisters. So I guess I just got story time embedded in me. So, uh, you know, it's all about just having that influence and reading what you're interested in, and that creates the thirst for reading. So that's my first time experience. Mike, do you want to go? Go for it. I'll follow after you. All right. So, man, I'm, I'm so hello, everybody. First of all, um, I'm kind of like AJ, man. I, I, I've read Sports Illustrated. Um, I, I love football. So he, he like he loved basketball. I love football. And my mom was like, I'm going to get you these Sports Illustrated magazines. I probably was like seven seven or eight and I got them until I like left the house so like till I was 18 so I was like getting them every you know what I'm saying every week and you know I went from you know a, a point where you know I'm really only looking at the pictures to now I'm reading the whole magazine from from cover to cover so that was my main thing that I my main piece of literature if you will that I read um as a child I had uh, a book I had a couple of books there were some he-man books he-man and the masters of the universe I read this book and funny story about this book. I had this book and the one that was called The River of Run. And I read this book over and over and over again. I got till I was about 17 years old and I found the book in like a crate somewhere. I was like, oh man, you know, I'm looking at my book. Oh, they gonna my, my He-Man book. And I was like, The River of Ruin. I had been calling that book The River of Run for 11 years. So I was like, oh, so I must be a little bit dyslexic. <laughs> but and that was even with me reading like Sports Illustrated the whole time. Um, but yeah, that's that's what I did uh, as well. I, I read a lot of Sports Illustrated. Um, really did that. That was that was really it. Besides going to school, I, I never went to the library. I I don't even know what the inside of Richmond's library looks like. Tell you the truth. All right, go ahead, Mike. <laughs> Thank you. Now, I think reading has always been a part of my life. Um, my mom was also my teacher. I was homeschooled all the way up until uh, all the way up until high school. So I've always read. Uh, my parents always had us reading for an hour a day. They didn't care what we read. We read Wayside School, Junie B. Jones, but not Buddy. First book I ever remember reading was Where the Wild Things Are. I ended up having tattooing it on my arm. So it like, tells you how much I ended up loving that one. But I love sports too. I love basketball. I love football. So I started reading Matt Christopher all the way up until high school. 
Um, even when we were playing video games, we would mute the video games and we would listen to Chronicles of Narnia and other things on audiobook. Um, so I've always been into reading, uh, but the library was a big part of my life. I've had a library card since I was five years old, um, and I now work for the library where I got my first library card from. So I'm a true lifelong reader. I was just going to, and that's my follow-up question was, um, tell us about your childhood and adolescent experiences in public and school libraries. What was that like for y'all? I could go. Uh, I, I, go ahead, go ahead, AJ. Um, I, I was, no, go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead, sir. Go ahead, sir. I was just saying that the, the school library was just a place to, to hang out for me because I didn't have to go to the library to read because I did so much reading at home. But I got to know the library from the school library. And then when I would go to the local library, the Dewey Decimal System drove me crazy. So I was always asking questions of the librarian and pestering them to find what I needed to find. Plus, it was a place where all the girls were, so that was a place to hang out. Yeah, Mr. Seku. <laughs> I'll real. go ahead and jump in. I know, I'll, I'll go ahead and jump in. Um, we went to the school library from time to time in school, um, you know, just like with your class. Um, the only thing I can really remember about the library is I always, I always did feel safe in the library. I, I could say that there was always this aura in the library where you come in. For me, I felt safe in that space more than I think any other place in the school. Um, and you know, what I mean, so it was just a nice place to be. So that, I mean, that's really what I remember the most about. It. I think what I remember is going inside of the media center and they having book fairs. And the books I wanted, my mom said, no, I can't get no more video game books. And always seeing older white women telling me and my friends to be quiet because we too loud in the library. Ironically, you know, this is what we're doing now, telling the kids to be quiet in the library. So um, it's always been a positive experience. The only times we actually went was when we was at school. So um, I thought it was pretty interesting just listening to everybody else's stories and even seeing how I see the teens and the tweens and the elementary kids coming to the library. It was a different experience, but you see how important the library is for the youth. It was, inter it was interesting for me to grow up in, um, in a public library, even for now, because I work with the same library system. It's very weird to see my childhood librarian still in the library system that I work for. Um, but I always loved it, like Mr. John said. I was, it was a safe place for me. It's where I hung out. It's where I felt safe. We got to know the librarians. They always would greet us when we'd come in and grab our holds. They would teach us how to use a self-checkout machine. Um, and then I never had any experience in school libraries being homeschooled. So I think we, I got to go to a Scholastic Book Fair somehow. I don't remember how we got invited to the Scholastic Book Fair when we were homeschooled, but we made it. And then otherwise, my first true experience with school libraries was as a children's librarian, um, visiting the kids throughout Vallejo and Fairfield. So that was definitely an interesting experience for me growing up and then coming full circle as an actual librarian. Do you feel like through your trajectory, like you felt like there was the moments where y'all had a um, a more frequent interaction versus maybe there was a moment when y'all fell off? And do you remember what might have caused that? Or was it pretty consistent for y'all in terms of school and public libraries going to those? And how were the librarians like how how do you feel like? Were they there for you? Like, because, you know, Mr. Billy shared us his experience, like, please, please share those experiences as well. You know, to be honest, I can't remember any of the librarians in my neighborhood when I was growing up. I guess because I did so much reading, I didn't rely on the library to do the reading. Um, but I do know the impact that the library had once I got involved with libraries at Langston Hughes Library. I know the impact that the library had on children in our community. Um, as, as most of the brothers said, it was a safe haven for the children to come to after school. Um, and once we got them in the library, there, I, I told my, I did an interview about the library early this week, and I was saying there were two things that children asked for the first thing they came into the library. The first one was, where was the bathroom? And the second was, can somebody help me with my homework? 
And that got us started in creating an after-school homework assistance program at our library for initially it started from third to seventh graders. And we would hire local high schools, uh, high school and, and college students to be the tutors, paid tutors. So it provided job opportunities as well. And over the 36 years that I was at Langston Hughes, we now have great grandparents bringing their great grandchildren to that same homework assistance program. And students will still come there now that the libraries are reopen. And that will be the place that mom says, after school, you go to the library, I'll pick you up on the way home, but that's where I expect you to be when I come out of the, come from work, you be at the library. So the library is that safe haven for a lot of our children. Now, I'm glad to hear that, Mr. Sekou, because where I, where I am right now, we have, like, my library is, like, right um, right around three schools, the middle school, the high school, and the elementary school for the, for the island. And so we get a lot of students um, at the library, and most of them are, like, you know, they're sitting there, they're waiting for their parents to come pick them up, they're asking, you know, they're, they're trying to do their homework, they're, they're trying to decompress from the day, you know, from being in high school and wearing a mask all day. And um and so and so yeah like this this is something that's needed like it, it was needed when you first started your program and it's still needed today um and so I'm I'm, I'm just I'm just kind of like glad to hear I'm just it's funny to hear um as far as for me like the library was kind of around even when I wasn't I wasn't even thinking about trying to be in the library I, I got the I got the old Dominion and my work study was at the library. Um, I went to, I went to try to find like a real job and you know, eventually I was like, oh, well, you know, I was working at the library for two years. Well, let me go try the library. Ended up at the library, left the library again after like seven years and did all kinds of crazy stuff and ended back at the library again. So, you know, that, that third time was a charm and it was like, look, like this is where you're supposed to be. I keep trying to put you somewhere. Like, listen, and so, but like, that's kind of been my experience with the library. It's almost like this is always like a home. It's always a safe, a safe space for me. Um, just to piggyback off of Mr. John, um, very similar experience as far as the library. Um, me growing up, I think it was a disconnect probably after elementary school, you know, like middle school and high school, I wasn't in the library like that. But once I got back into college and I was uh, at Lincoln University of Missouri, one of my friends, when I was trying to get into the nursing program, I needed a job. And he was like, look, man, come work for the library. So when I started working in the library, and I noticed how active the library was. I didn't know libraries had cafes. I didn't know you can get DVDs from the library. Like, so when I was introduced to this world, and I was like, oh, people look like us in here? I was like, okay, this is dope. So even now, like at my current library and my previous library where we had partnerships with a middle school and an elementary school, when you see all these kids come in, it is a beautiful thing because I think times have changed. Parents don't trust their kids at home, so they need somewhere to go. So they need to be in a safe haven spot like the other brothers mentioned, where we can provide program, educational resources, and just introduce them to a different element because I don't remember or recall any interactions with the librarians I had when I was younger. So when I'm connecting with them, asking them how their day was, that go a long way as far as establishing rapport and getting them interested in what they want to read, what type of programs, versus me just going to Baker and Taylor, just ordering whatever i got the source right there so um it, it's a really really dope experience to engage with the youth because you'd be so uh, provide i mean surprised at how much information you get because guess what that's our job anyway is to get information i was always really close um with my with my local librarians they it meant a lot to me they always knew who i was we'd see them in costco and they'd recognize you and even though we thought we thought we always thought they lived in the library so we were shocked to see them in costco shopping with all of us um, but they always greeted us by name they always knew who we were and that meant everything to me um, and i was lucky and lucky enough to be a children's librarian in a small neighborhood library which i think small libraries are the best libraries just because they are able to connect with everybody who visits. Um, and the same thing as everyone else was saying, and, um, I use my childhood librarian's influence on me, knowing who I am, to connect with all the kids and middle schoolers and high schoolers who came into the library. And I was able to get to know them and get them to trust me. And even when the middle schoolers are showing off for all the girls, as soon as, then they're, as, soon as they're done, they come back and they're like, all right, where was that book you were talking about? Now we can get down to business and all that good stuff. So uh, yeah, the library definitely had an impact on me growing up. Um, 
I don't think there's ever a time where I didn't go to the library. Maybe I went through some things for a few years before I became a library worker. Um, so maybe that two year window. And other than that, libraries have been in my life for 29 of 31 years. Did you all have reading role models? If so, who was it? Like Sekou mentioned, like his mom was a teacher, but who was that re reading role model and what did they do to model, you know, your literacy practices? My, my first role model for reading was my was not necessarily my mother, who was the one that made sure we did our reading as the mother teacher, but my father was my first role model. One, he was always reading the Bible, but he read the newspapers, he read the magazines, he read. So the example of it was cool to read came from my father. And then the second role model was my older brother who was, who was in college when we were in elementary and middle school and him always having books around him and reading. And then of course him having all these good looking girlfriends, I figured there must be a connection between going to school, reading and girls. So that was always the, the model that I had that I wanted to emulate uh, and I'll, I'll tell you a, a short story. When I graduated from middle school, my older brother Walter gave me this book. It was Langston Hughes's Simple Stakes of Claim. And in the cover of the book, 1960, dear Press, he called me by my middle name, Preston. Dear Preston, I hope you find out who Langston Hughes is, your brother Walt. That was in 1960. 20 years later, I started working at Langston Hughes Library. And then I really started learning who Langston Hughes was because I started reading all the works of Langston Hughes. So that was my that was my role models to, to, to read and that was cool to read and cool to be around books. I would say my role models were obviously my parents, my father, you know, he was a diehard Laker fan like me. Well, you know, we were checking out the box scores of Michael Jordan. Uh, even when Magic left the Lakers, we were checking out the Lakers before Kobe came. When Nick Van Axel, we, we were always reading the box scores because back then social media wasn't around or we didn't have NBA League Pass. So we had to read the newspapers to get a hold and stay updated on um, what was going on in the NBA world. But also my mother, she was going to school while she was help raising me and my sister. So she was in nursing school. So she was always throwing books at me. She's like, AJ, what do you need to read? What are, what are you interested in? She stayed and risked, you know, her money financially as far as subscribing to, like uh, Mr. John said, Sports Illustrated, basketball magazines, video game magazines, hip hop magazines. So when, when she was reading and studying, me and my sister was at the table reading with her. So that all obviously established a culture of reading and it never left me. So I, I'm just thankful for that. You just reminded me that in the summertime, when you're ready to go out there and spend the whole summer out in the park playing ball, my mother would say, I know you're going to go out to the park and I'm not going to see you until dinner time. But before you go out, you got to sit down and read for an hour. And that was a teacher in her over the summer. She said, you're not going to use your reading skills over the summer. You're going to read at least an hour every day before you go out and play. Man, I would say... I really didn't have a mentor per se. I, my mentor was boredom, okay? So I was the only child or my mama's only child. I live with my mama. And so when I got in trouble, you know, the TV got shut down, the video games got shut down. And so what I had left, He-Man and them Sports Illustrated. Now, so, I, and that, you know, I would read them. I read them over and over and over again. But secondly, um, just like Mr. Sekou, uh, I think he said your dad um, was reading the Bible. Um, my mom got to a point later in life where she started reading the Bible. <laughs> and so she was reading a lot. And uh, one time I did something. I was doing, did something foolish. I stayed in trouble, but I, I feel like I ain't do that much bad. But anyway, she was like, boy, you, boy, you need some wisdom. Go read Proverbs. <laughs> so, <laughs> and so I was like, okay. And so I started reading Proverbs. So then that would be the other major book that I started reading because I read Proverbs and then I just like kept reading because I was like, where well, is this big book? I'm, let me just keep reading this, you know, and that way maybe I'll stay out of trouble. It's their panel discussion thing. I, th I think I had three, three different role models for reading role models growing up. My mom was my biggest one. She would always read to us 
Um, it's when we were kids. Every single day she'd read to us. She would read, she even read for school. She read the Homer, she read Odyssey. She even read A Child Called It by Dave Pelzer, which I don't know if you read that book, but it should not have been read aloud to kids, but she still did it and it had impact. We weren't scarred. So kudos to her for that. Um, I think the second one was my grandfather, my mom's dad. Um, he was, a, he's the biggest Stephen King fan in the world. Um, and then he and I read, read the Harry Potter um, as, as kids and grandpa. We would just talk about that after every single book. Um, so that was big. I think that's the, that's the closest thing I am to my grandfather is reading Harry Potter. Um, and then third is LeVar Burton. I love LeVar, LeVar Burton and Reading Rainbow. If I hear the Reading Rainbow theme song, it just makes my soul awaken a little bit. Just the style and energy he had reading books. Um, it meant the world to me. Um, some of you guys may not know, but I do too many TikToks and I love using the Reading Rainbow theme song and LeVar Burton. So those are my three reading role models. They made me who I am today. Right, thank you. I would like to hold on, Tiffany, before you start. Um, I just want to point out, like, I hope, I hope young people get to like see this or hear this, or at least like uh, some some portions of this, because you are you're hearing and seeing the many different environments of of people who consider themselves to be readers. Like, you know, so you have someone who's been reading all their life, and then you got others that you know kind of like read sporadically or, or read like things that weren't necessarily considered to be reading. Um, Cause a lot of like AJ, you know, all of us probably, you know, the, the parent will come in. I want my child to read War and Peace. Where the War and Peace books at? You're like, what? What are you talking about? <laughs> like, you know, what I'm saying? you're like, so it's, it's just is 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 good to hear. And I hope people get to see that you know you don't have to have the perfect, um, or you know what we call the kind of consider like the perfect upbringing to be a reader. Like all you got to really do. Is like just read the things that you really love, and, and and you know, and just go from there. I have to piggyback off that as well. One of the things that I remember having conversations not only with kids that came to the library that uh, with the homework program, which was on the same floor as my office outside my office, a big open floor, and we had the homework program there. Whenever the kids would act up, especially the little boys, when they would act up, they had to go to see Mr. Jackson. So I would sit down and talk to them about, you know, why don't you like to be, what's wrong, what's going on, and and, and befriend them. Uh, and they all knew me because I came from the neighborhood. So it wasn't like I was a stranger. I grew up in that same neighborhood that I worked in for 36 years. So that was home. So they would sit there and be good because it was Mr. Jackson and they knew their mother or their grandmother knew who Mr. Jackson was. Um, and then I'd start talking to them. And then I would start talking to them about things that dealt with Black history. And that was the other thing that happened with this library, is that it introduced, introduced me to my history and culture. But I would start asking the questions to try to find out what they were interested in. And then I would take them downstairs and take them to the children's room and let them see books about what they were interested in, whether it was the Lakers or whether it was the Knicks or in, the, in New York, it wasn't the Lakers, it was the Knicks or the, or the Nets, or it was the Mets or the Yankees and then start them looking at things. But the other thing that got them interested was the fact that there were books in the library that dealt with Black people. And it wasn't because they didn't get that in school. It wasn't in their curriculum. They got introduced to their history and culture. And then once I got them interested in things, they would calm down, they would sit down, they would listen. And then I could get them to go back out and sit out there and do their homework on a regular basis. One of the things that I thought what y'all were saying was interesting and when, when you were um, kind of reminiscing on growing up about that was how, how could the relationship have been improved and what difference would that have made? You know, so that's something I would like people to think about as well, because, you know, like Michael had, you know, a librarian who knew, who knew his name and, and things like that. What difference would that have made, you know, like with the kids that people see coming in and things of that nature as well? Um, I would like to comment on that, but that is a big thing when you talk about librarians in general, when they always talk about all the kids coming into the library. The reason why I've been successful dealing with the kids, and I tell them because I talk to them, I treat them like they're adults, especially the middle school and high schoolers. You developing that rapport them goes a long way when they do probably need homework assistance or want just someone to talk to because they're going through puberty or they like girls or Mr. Billy, um, could you do a uh, program? <laughs> make it happen you know because i'm getting that information from them you have to engage with the youth you know um you can't shy away from them i'm, I'm telling you like you you get so much energy and i think the dopest thing about it is 
you get to see them grow up. I mean, I literally, when I left um, Pembroke Pines Library, I literally was doing programs and providing resources for kids in elementary school and in middle school. And I've seen them driving now. I'm like, what's going on here? Some of them going to college, you know, having teens wanting to come back to volunteer to the library. You don't understand how much impact that you have, especially when they see someone that looks like them. It's a different type of language. Like a lot of my, I hate to say it, some of my librarians I used to manage, you know, they were white and they used to look at me like, and they would be like, how are you having this connection? And I'm like, look, it, it, I mean, it's something that you can't teach, but I am engaging with them. I, I'm gonna always say that word because that is so important. I mean, that, so that's just a little food for thought, you know, as far as engaging with the teams. Yeah, there's another link that may not, may be invisible to, to everybody listening to this or watching this, but there's two different links that I've heard so far that cannot be overlooked. From my generation to Michael's generation, you see that gap in time, but you see the commonality. One of the common factors I see, because I did an extensive amount of outreach into my community, schools, organizations, churches, city agencies, Rikers Island for 14 years, going back and talking to inmates. And one of the things that always shocked them was I was a black man and I was a librarian. And the impact that had on young brothers that librarians could be men change their perspective. In fact, the first librarian director at Lang Senior's Library was a man because the woman who was selected to be the director said, no, no, we need, in fact, the Black Panther Party said, we need a man to be a role model for brothers to read and libraries as a cool thing to do. So having men in librarianship, like E.J. Josie, who was my mentor, was part of that catalyst that the impact, you can't even understand what that impact is on younger generations. The second is all of us talked about books and reading from home before we even got to the library. So the impact that the family has, seeing dad read, seeing mom read, seeing books be cool, seeing libraries at the home, like I see behind Donald and Alan, that is part of that lexicon that a lot of children don't have. But that was the purpose that the library served, because if you couldn't afford to buy books and have them at home, you could borrow them at the library and learn how to be responsible and take them back. So um, I didn't. I also wanted to, since we're kind of going into that realm, how did y'all find out about and become librarians? Tell that story. I'm gonna go last on this one because I can talk about that for an hour. <laughs> I guess I'll go first. Um, I was like well on my way. Well, first and foremost, I flunked out of uh, college initially trying to chase all the girls. And um, my dad made me enlist into the Air Force. So I had to mature, travel the world. And when I got out of the military, um, I was 22, trying to figure out what I wanted to do. So I ended up going back to school to work on my bachelor's at 25, to, to follow my mom's footsteps and becoming a nurse. Midway through my undergrad, shout out to my homeboy, Bradley Kirkendall at Lincoln University. Um, he was like, yo, man, I'm about to be a librarian. And the first question that I asked him is the same question I get to this day. I said, what the hell do a librarian do? And when he introduced me to the field of librarianship, he introduced me to our mentor, Jerome Offord. And then we got introduced to Kelvin Watson and McKeever Foster. And I did not know how big this field was. And I thought it was pretty dope. I was like, I never saw black male librarians before. Like Mr. Jackson said, like, so I ended up changing my um, bachelor's degree and getting my bachelor's degree in biology with a minor in library science. And then when I moved back home to North Carolina, I got my MLS from NCCU in 2016. So I'm five years in the game and I haven't looked back. And I felt like, you know, I always felt like I was an entertainer hosting talent shows and stuff like that. So my ability to engage with the youth was kind of natural. So I ended up falling into um, being a youth librarian. And, you know, and everybody loves engaging with the little ones. I love storytelling, but I also like impacting the older ones too. Because, you know, that is so important. Representation is important. I say this all the time. What we're doing right here on this panel is so important for the young ones because it's more to Black men than becoming an athlete or a rapper. And you can do some positive things. And librarianship has changed my life. So I'm just trying to spread the word, bring more brothers into the field because it's much needed. It's a dope field. You have a lot of career advancement. Um, I've been blessed. And I, I just love seeing brothers like, 
everyone on this panel, you know, practicing the field of librarianship. Look, I, I'll go ahead and, and go after AJ after he didn't gave that rousing rendition of why you should be a, a black librarian. Uh, <laughs> but and, and I'll use something that AJ liked because AJ loved basketball. So I love to help people. If I if I was playing basketball, AJ, I would be a point guard. Okay. I I, I would rather pass the ball and let somebody else score and then be the one that had to go and try to score myself. That's that's always how I've been. And I was like, I was just out there. I mean, I didn't know what I really wanted to do. I majored, like I said, I majored in history. I got my degree in history, but I still couldn't figure out like how I wanted to do it. And, and all of these other little jobs that I was finding, it was always kind of in like the service field. Um, the last job before I got the library, before I really began to be a librarian was um, insurance. And, you know, all of that's like kind of like customer service, like helping people, helping people. And so, when I was able to get back into the library in 2015, um, I just kind of like I said, I was like kind of looking at. So you know what? I love to help people. I love the library. Like I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go full steam ahead uh, with this. And when man, when I went, when I got back in there, um, oh my goodness, it was just so. I, it's 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 like I haven't been working since like 2015. I haven't been working. I just been, I go somewhere and I get paid because really I would do it for free. You know what I'm saying? If I, if, if I had $10 million, I would I, I, I go and just volunteer at the library all day. Like I would do it for free, but thank God they paid me. I appreciate that. Um, but yeah, man. And I, and I was working with the youth. Um, oh, it was, it was just, it's wonderful, man. Just to see, just to see like their, their eyes, man, when they look at you. Um, when you're doing story time or you're telling a story or you're you're doing the craft and you on the floor with them and both of y'all, both of y'all trying to color something or put something together. You're like, look at Mr. John. Like, what, what, what does yours look at? Like, mine don't look old. Oh, yours look good. Look, man, it was just, it's just wonderful. It's just wonderful. And I'm and and so having those um experiences is what led me to go and go ahead and like, let me go ahead and get this degree and stop playing now. Let me stop playing and play for 30 some odd years. Let me stop playing and go ahead and get this degree. And um, and so I, I love it. I mean, I finally found the place where I was supposed to be after being out there, not really knowing what I wanted to do. For me, I think I kind of stumbled upon becoming a librarian. Um, I think, again, I grew up in libraries, but I think in the back of my mind, I never knew that I could become a librarian. Um, I never saw a male librarian. Um, I don't even think I ever saw a person of color librarian, even growing up in libraries. Um, and then I, I experienced um, severe depression, uh, panic disorder, um, and anxiety. Um, and then I semi, somehow I returned to the library and I was just reading books um, every single day. And then I went up to the front desk and I asked the person there, how you become, how can I apply for the library? And I don't remember if I thought like maybe they would say no. I don't think they were. I think I didn't. I don't think I thought they were going to say no. People like you can't apply to become a librarian. I'm sure somewhere in the back of my mind it was there. Uh, but no, she said you can apply. So I went to the I went to the county site. I applied to be a shelver. Um, I got hired. I was a shelver for two years. I saw a posting for library aid. I said, hey, I like this job. Maybe I'll apply. Maybe if I get it, maybe librarianship is for me. Um, and then they took, they, they showed me some kindness and they gave me the library aid job. I became a library assistant. Um, I went to library school while I was working full time, um, became a library associate briefly and then got hired as a librarian. It was a children's librarian, loved it for a year. Um, so yeah, I stumbled upon becoming a librarian. Uh, my introduction to becoming a librarian was by accident. Um, the irony is as active as I am in this profession now, and as active as you know me, Tiffany, and Alan, and the rest of you know me, Donald, with BCLA and the executive board and past president, I was, I didn't go into it knowingly. I had worked in human resources for eight years. I'd worked in, when I was up in Nevada, California, I worked with uh, Robinson Chevrolet, so I was in sales and in customer service. Then I came back to New York. I was out of work looking for work for 18 months. And then the, the members of the community board at our library said, Andrew, you need to apply for this job as the assistant supervisor. It wasn't director. It was called the assistant supervisor because they need somebody with some background in business. 
They need somebody who's from the community and has been an activist in the community, and we need you at the library. So I said, look, I'm looking for work. I need to pay my bills. I worked there for a couple of years, and then I go back to California. The rest is history because once I got at Langston Hughes, I started understanding the difference between what that library was about. It was a, a library that was focused on the Black experience for the, the borough of Queens and not just our local community. And after I'd been there for a couple of years and got settled in a job, they said, Andrew, you need to go back and finish your undergraduate degree. So I transferred to York College here in Queens. And the first class I took was a Black Studies class. So taking Black history that just opened my eyes to this history I'd never known about, I'd never heard about Paul Robes. I knew who Paul Robes was, but all this history of our people and then having access to the library as the supervisor on Sunday when nobody was there, I'd come in the library, spend the whole day doing all my research and studies at the library. And the more I got ingrained in the library, the more I got ingrained in history and culture, that's what started the transition for my life and it just changed completely. E.J. Josie was the one that said, you need to become a librarian because I really had gotten so immersed in black studies that I wanted to get my master's in library, uh, master's in black studies and Africana studies. And even think about going to get a PhD, which is a whole story in itself. But the only two campuses that had graduate programs was Temple University in Philadelphia and Cornell University, upstate New York. And I wasn't going to leave my job at Langston because I was so committed to what I was doing there to take time off for a year or two years to go and work on a graduate degree. So EJ said, well, why don't you get your library science degree? You're in the profession. You muted yourself, Sekou. Uh, that was how I got involved in the library in black studies and the transition the transition it made in my life came from being at Langston Hughes Library. So let's talk about um, children's librarianship. Talk about um, just an overview of you know some of the positives and barriers and what it was like to be you know um, a male librarian of color as a children, you know, like as a children's librarian and those experiences, share that with us. I guess I'll open that up because I'm probably the only one here that wasn't a children's or a young adult librarian. I came in as a manager, but my outreach, I participated in, in read-ins, I participated in career days, um, I would go to the schools and schools and do talks on black history. I would introduce the students to Kwanzaa, so my interaction with the schools, they thought I was a children's librarian, and then I would bring them to the library and introduce them to the librarian. But as the manager, I had the ability to do the, all of that outreach to the in total community and even work, go to parent organizations and talk to them about the importance of libraries, talk to them about the importance of them sitting down and reading with their children and not leave it to the responsibility of the teacher. Uh, so my impact was as a manager, but the impact was that I was representing the library profession and not just Langston Hughes Library. Um, I would say uh, my experience being a youth librarian has been amazing. It's been life changing. Um, like Mr. Jackson said, outreach is so important. Um, every library has its own community. And that's the dopest thing about being a children's librarian that you're gonna engage in different diverse communities. And I learned this term a couple of years ago and I really believe youth librarians should abide by that. It's the three C's, creation, curiosity, and community. Like you have to have those three C's as far as trying to adapt and uh, assess what the community needs. I mean, we have a up taking an uprise of young adult parents coming up right now. Um, you have a lot of single parents. You have a lot of stay-at-home moms, depending on what type of community. I've worked in communities where you had to stay at home moms. People had money, but guess what? Just because they had money, they didn't have nothing to do with their kids. They needed resources. They needed programs, especially during the summertime. Story time was so important into developing their early literacy skills and also giving the parents a break, you know, and then exposing them to other resources. I mean, I think that is the most fulfilling thing as far as introducing 
families and communities every day to what the library has to offer. I mean, this past Saturday, I dressed up as a pirate and convinced my staff to dress up as pirates for talk like a pirate day. And I was doing that, I'm managing the library, but guess what? Every time I see families coming around, I'm giving them spontaneous story times because the best thing about the, being a youth librarian is you can create an experience. Every time you come into the library, it's going to be an experience when you come in there. And that's the most gratifying thing. Um, I don't think it's any negative um, things that's happened to me as far as being a youth librarian. Maybe the challenges of transitioning into management. But also, I mean, I'll never forget my first librarian job in Jacksonville. We was meeting all the higher ups in library administration, and it was an older white man. He had to be at least by 85. So he was just staring at me in orientation like this. And I knew what he was getting at. He said, do you know how rare you are? And, and I said, sir, I'm just happy to be here. Because I, I knew what he was getting at. You know, so, you know, we are considered unicorns in this field. And, you know, and I, and I wear it with a badge of honor because I know we're impacting the youth. Man, AJ, I just in the public. Oh, who was that? <laughs> I was just gonna chime in. Oh, good. Uh, a um, a public school uh, children's librarian, um, K five for the past ten years. You mentioned uh, barriers. Uh, it's it's a great job, but um, some of the barriers that I know uh, in the public schools we run into is we're stretched so thin and um. Technology falls on us in a lot of cases to be the IT person, which, uh, you know, not necessarily our primary job or doing um, extra duties like uh, car duty, you know, cafeteria duty, things like that. But overall, it's it's really a, a wonderful um, field to be in. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Andre. Yeah, thank you, Andre. Yeah, I was I've. Um... I've reached out to some of the school librarians um, where I am now, man. I'm telling you, like, I'm like trying to like offer services. Hey, you know, what you want me to do? I can do this. They like, man, look, I'm trying to get these computers out of here. Okay. Like that's all I'm doing. I'm trying to get them out or <laughs> I'm trying to get them fixed. So yeah, so we, we need to pray for our school librarians uh, <laughs> specifically. Um, but as far as for, for me, um, with being a youth librarian, Man, I by the time I by the time I got back into the library in 2015, I was like so comfortable with who I who I am as a person. Um, and I had a, a nice long journey. So by the time I got there, you know, I, I really had like knowledge of who I am, knowledge of self, and I didn't even like I took it for granted that I was in this space doing what I was doing and helping. I'm, we were and I'm we was I was in a library that had. Um, all ethnicities, was, you know, all ethnicities came to our library, all ages came to our library. And so, you know, I was there and I was just working. I was just having a good time. And, and my wife, she, um, she said some, something and she was like, you know, them kids ain't never seen a black librarian before. And I was like, uh-uh, like, what are they, like, what you talking about? And I'm sitting here. And then I started thinking about, you know, again, like my early library experiences, and like when I think, anytime I think about a school librarian, I think about this this old woman, and I, I think she probably had like Parkinson's or something, cause she was, you know, she was always shaking. And like that was that's like when, you, when I think about librarians, like that's the person that I think about. And so you know, it kind of dawned on me after a while that, you know, I'm I am I'm giving the I'm showing these ch these children the, the the young people here something that I never saw in my life. And I've seen a few people um, in the chat put things up saying you know, they never saw a black librarian until they got to college or this place or that place. And it was just like, it was just like, wow. I'm like, you know, I was kind of taken aback um, from it. And, you know, but at the same time, I love what I, you know, I was doing. I know who I am. So I was always comfortable, am always com comfortable wherever I am, you know, no matter if I'm going to, you know, a school on the south side or school on the east side, north side, it, it don't, it, you know, it doesn't matter to me. Um, but like the other day, one of the kids came up, one of the students, one of the teens came and I was like, you know, you know, they came up, they dabbed me up. I was like, how you doing? He was like, oh, Mr. John is here today. I can check out a book. And I was like, 
man, you can check out a book any day. <laughs> you can check out a book any day, man. He was like, nah, nah. I, I'll check out a book when you hear. And, you know, it, it says two different things. That statement says two different things. But, you know, I just like appreciating my, my presence and understanding that, you know, that I'm needed for certain, especially for black boys. Um, I'm needed and we're needed to be in that space uh, for them to be comfortable. Um, I always felt comfortable no matter who was in the library, but that's not always going to be the same, you know, situation for other people. So. I think someone in the chat had mentioned how it's hard for kids to get to the library sometimes because their parents are tired after work um, or whatever circumstances are happening. And I think in my experience, that is one of the biggest challenges as a children's librarian is accessibility for kids and families to the library, which I'm going to echo everybody else and say that's why outreach is so important. Um, I was always doing outreach. I would spend eight hours at the school talking to every single class if I could. I was blessed with super cool, friendly, kind coworkers who were willing to take extra desk hours so I could talk to as many people as possible. Um, I would always agree to any, any school, any center, anyone who asked for me to come and talk to their kids about the library, about library cards, about the importance of books, any books, regardless of their AR level, just the joy of reading. I was more than happy to talk to them about that. Um, outreach always created some of the coolest opportunities, the coolest moments for me. I remember I, I would go to a lot of the same centers, same child starts, same locations. And one of my favorite memories is this little girl was, she, I saw her every single time and she was about to, she was about to leave. She was telling me, she was like, I'm, I'm not gonna see you anymore, Mr. Michael. First she came in and she said, Mr. Michael, my brown librarian. I wanna be a brown librarian. I'm gonna be leaving soon. Someday I'm gonna be a brown librarian and I will see you again. And then she sat down and her little friend next to her who was white said, well, I wanna be a brown librarian. And she leaned next to me, she said, well, we can all be brown librarians. So, because kids don't see my color, they just see me as a crayon, they see my skin color. Right. And so just like that, because of outreach, because of being out there, because of just showing the joy of books. I'm not the smartest librarian. I don't know everything at all. I will admit that every single time, but I just have sheer library and book joy. And I think that's what the kids saw. That's why I tried to show them every single time. And that's why maybe she and her little friend want to be brown librarians someday, even if one of them is not. It doesn't have to be brown. Right. I have to piggyback off that because there are two, two instances I can think of. Uh, the most recent was, I think in 2019, when I had to go back to Atlanta to uh, close out my, my brother's affairs when he passed away. Um, I'm sitting in the airport getting ready to come back to New York and this young, good looking tall brother sits across from me and I'm sitting there reading and he keeps looking up and I'm watching him and I'm seeing that this is a probably gonna be a lawyer or a doctor one day. And he looks at me and he says, excuse me, can I ask you a question? I said, yes. He says, aren't you from Langston Hughes Library? And this is in Atlanta, Georgia. And he's the Langston Hughes Library is located in Corona, Queens, New York. He says, aren't you from Langston Hughes Library? I said, yes. He says, aren't you Mr. Jackson? I said, yes. He says, I thought I remembered you. He said, I was in the homework program and you always made us want to read. You always made us want to, to want to be, to, to do the right thing and, and do our homework. And you always made us proud that you were a black man running that library. And so you never know the influence that you have on children that come into the library and what that impact can mean years later. The other story was a young brother who was one of those reluctant readers that I sat down one day and I introduced him to Langston Hughes poetry and I introduced him to black history. He now is a father of, I think, three or four boys. He lives in Florida. He's got his own business uh, in Southern Florida. So he's not in the Broward County area, brother. Uh, he's down in Southern Florida and he says, he, he's to this day, he sits down with his children, reads Black history books to them, talks about Black history, as it makes sure he takes them to the library and they all have their library cards and they circulate books. Because he said, I learned that from you when I was a kid that was a reluctant reader, you to make one that made me want to learn how to read. So those things stay with you when you hear about them years later. I want to ask two more questions and open it up and if we can like do this succinctly because I want to give the audience a chance to ask questions and I'll try to mush it together and, and just take whatever angle you want. 
Um, what barriers do you see um, for engaging Black males with literacy and what needs to happen to engage Black males with literacy? So I'm going to end with that and then I can open it up for questions for other folks. So if everybody, the panelists can chime in. Um, from my experience, um, the main barrier is the communication. Like once again, I keep saying you have to communicate with the youth. They'll tell you everything what they want to read. I mean, you can't assume that it's just like with us as an adults. I can't assume what Mr. John likes to read as an adult. You know, you had your, your job is supposed to assess the needs. Um, times have changed. You got to get creative with reading. Um, I always tell the teens, you, you ain't going to never stop reading. You know, if you say reading it, you don't like reading that book. Well, let me find something you want to read. You know, I know most of the, the young men either like sports or let's say they're into graphic novels. I, I like to talk to them and I'll indirectly be kind of getting the feel of what they're into. And that's what I go to as far as when I go to my book ordering or if I'm trying to create a program is just, OK, I remember what James said or I remember what his homie said, what they wanted to read. They didn't see no books last week when Kobe Bryant died last year. You know, I said, oh, no, this is all bad. So I made that happen. So it's all about interacting with the youth. I think that eliminates the barrier as far as trying to get the information and resources you need to give to them. To add on top of that, um, and somebody put this in the chat, I believe as well, is the representation. It's the seeing, to, it's the seeing it at home. So seeing it in your community, in your sphere. So seeing people read. Um, when they when they see that you know see that you're reading, then they're more apt to to read. When you have books at home and you have that access to books, then you're they're going to be um, you know they're going to be readers if they have the books at home. So just I'm just piling on top of what AJ said, but representation. So if, so if you're a, if you're a parent or someone a guardian educator that's listening, like just just let them see you read sometime. You know, you or you know, like just hold the book. You, you just hold the book. You know what I'm saying? And then that way they were like, oh, you know what, Dad reading or, or or my mom reading or whatever. Let me go and see what's going on with reading. I think uh, the two things. One thing. One one of the principles I picked up from Kwanzaa is uh, self determination. And one of the things that I started doing when I got, it got introduced to Kwan's in the 1980s, is every time I give a gift, I, I, my, 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 my niece, when she was an infant, my, my triplet sister brought her off the plane in a bassinet. The first thing I did was give her a book of children's folk tales from Africa. So she couldn't read then, she was too small. But from that day on, every time I gave her a gift, no matter what the gift was for, graduation, birthday, whatever it is, she always got books. So now I'm helping her build her own library. And I think that is one of the things we need to do because reading and books are not part of our natural lexicon. We need to make sure that book children feel that books are accessible and it is cool to read. So every time you give them a gift for any purpose, include a book as part of that gift for something that they love, whether it's sports or fashion or history or American history, whatever it is, give them books so that they can develop their own library and feel comfortable around books. Some barriers that I've seen for reaching for reaching um, black boys and black men with books and literacy is at an early age is showing them that representation, showing them a person. Um, I remember finding out how often kids would tell you that they didn't have a dad, either their dad had unfortunately passed away or they knew that their dad was in jail. Um, but then they would see me and then they would see my tattoos on my arm. And they'd be like, hey, you have tattoos like my dad. You have tattoos like my uncle. Um, and they would connect to me and they would see me um, liking and appreciating reading. Um, and again, the cool factor of books is the hard part, uh, like the others, others were saying, showing them that there's something for everybody. There's Black Panda books. Um, there's, there's books that Kobe Bryant wrote, um, even. Um, even I, li I live in the Bay Area, so there are a bunch of Warriors fans who, like, who just found out that Steph Curry has a book club. Um, I would get to know them, and they would mess with me. I'd mess with them. They'd find out I'm a Lakers fan. They'd be like, why are you always cheering for the Lakers? Why, is it, why isn't it the Warriors? Um, and I'd be like, that's because the Lakers are 17-time champions. I'm sorry. What do you want me to tell you? And then from there, you make that connection, um, and it just grows from there. I think the way that we can keep on going forward 
um, is just reaching kids where they're at. I'm a big proponent of using social media to reach uh, black boys, um, black men even. even That's why I keep on using TikTok. Um, my library has a TikTok. I have a TikTok. I don't dance on TikTok. That's my only rule. Um, but using their, using their Instagram, asking them what they want to see, letting them set your content for you because they're the ones who are going to provide, provide you with the answers if you talk to them. They'll let you know how you can reach them to get them engaged with literacy. Thank you so much, panelists. I, I really do appreciate this. But if anybody in the audience has a question, please feel free to ask. It's fun to know Roosevelt Weeks, Austin Public Library. Mr. Seku, I have been inspired by you guys, uh, but I do want to make a couple statements. Uh, not a statement. Yeah, I do want to make a statement, and that's to Mr. Three and Mr. Uh, Allen. If you ever want to come to Austin to work, please let me know you got a job. <laughs> and I mean that. But thank you guys. Y'all been really inspiring. And, 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 you know, all the stuff we go through, uh, this was inspiring. Midweek manner, this is absolutely wonderful. Thank y'all for inspiring me to keep going on. Good to see you, Brother Weeks. I have to tell you, uh, one of the hardest decisions I had to make was retiring from day-to-day from -day librarianship. I mean, that was really a very difficult decision, but I'm still so involved in the profession, I don't feel like I'm retired because of my activity with BCLA and what I do. Uh, but the other thing I wanted to say that the inspiration of what we get from our children can turn out to be something that elevates your life as well. I was at a high school in Brooklyn doing a presentation, trying to encourage young people during uh, library week to read and use books and introduce them to Langston Hughes. They could not connect with Langston Hughes. So I started comparing at that time, uh, Tupac Shakur's book came out, the, the Rose That Grew From Concrete. And I had read that, read the poetry in there. And I started to compare Tupac's life with Langston Hughes's life and the themes in their poetry. And that started to connect them to who Langston Hughes was. And eventually I started writing about it. And I wrote a whole essay about um, entitled the In the Tradition, The Legacy of Cultural Messages from Langston Hughes to Tupac Shakur. And it actually got published. And I've been using that essay to interact with young people and connect them to students and reading and Langston Hughes since then. So you never know what the impact of what you do as a librarian is going to do on your life as a professional librarian and as an author and reader as well. So I love this profession. I also feel that all of us are doing what we do because the creator set that path for us because I never thought about being a librarian. But I would, I, when I look back, I could never think of anything that I would have done other than being a librarian. And everything I did before that was preparing me to be a librarian. Um, I, I want to answer the question Aaliyah um, asked of how we bridge the gap between the importance of growing up, seeing black male librarians and actually getting to work in libraries as far as like information and college. Honestly, I lived through it. I went through it. When I was at Lincoln University of Missouri, my mentor, Jerome Offer, created the only information library information science minor. And, and this is at an HBCU. So he had me and my homies. It was seven of us. And then it was 10 other brothers and sisters that was enrolled into this program. So only six of us actually went through it, but he put us in internships at Wash U when we was in St. Louis to get exposed to different um, fields of librarianship where I met Makiba Foster and Kelvin Watson. Well, we went to ALA for the first time, went to BCALA for the first time in 2012. Those are type of experiences and mentorship is everything as far as getting young black men into the libraries. So um, I'm gonna um, adopt that um, the same program that Mr. Offer did for me. And the ultimate way I can do that, I've been giving back. I've put on six of my homeboys that three of them are already in library school and three of them just got the MLS this past year. So, you know, I think us as black men just continue to get back, promoting the profession and that's going to stand out alone because they, you know, they see us. Once they see us, once they see a black male librarian, oh, they know the elephant in the room. So, you know, just continue to advocate for the profession and I feel like we're going to be fine. Hi, this is Jason Hill. I work at, I'm the early learning coordinator for San Francisco Public. I just want to say that 
I'm really inspired by you all. Um, it was actually a female Black librarian that encouraged me to do this, my career this way. Um, Sky Patrick, she got me over to Queen's Library. She's my bestie, I've known her forever. Um, and I work for Queen's Library. And it just encouraged me um, to do this work. And I thank you for giving us this space and share. I feel as far I don't feel alone anymore. I think I'm the only Black librarian in the San Francisco Public Library, or manager, um, upper level. But I also think I'm the only one in the whole system, unfortunately. Is, is, Sky, we're, still, is Sky still there in San Francisco? She's um, director of LA County now. Okay, if you take touch with, tell her I said hello. Yeah, I was texting her and shot a picture. I'm like, I know you know some of these people, but <laughs> I just have a question though. Um, how have you reached out to your black communities during the pandemic, like the children? Um, how have you done outreach that way since we're still kind of in it, obviously? Um, I'm just curious how you have been doing that. I know with me, um, as far as like daycares, head starts, um, even on my days off, I do outreach, do virtual story times, even my personal platform, Three King Vision, as far as promoting information, literacy resources. Um, you kind of got to think outside the box. I tell people all the time, we was always talking about how libraries are going to advance in the digital age. Um, it's already happened due to the pandemic. So we had to adjust. Um, coming up with creative uh, ways to create engagement. We did an initiative at my library where it enhanced the curbside experience of trying to get the older adults and teenagers in the ball called the I Heart Pembroke Pines Initiative. What we did was, okay, you can't come inside the library, but guess what? You can still check out books. You get a stamp card for every 10 stamps you get, you get a free book from the library, from the friends of the library. But you're like, okay, Mr. Billy, what, what, what's the catch? Everybody liked food. So I got donations. I did outreaches at the local grocery stores, restaurants, and I got I obtained like hundreds of dollars of gift cards to reward the patrons that checked out the most books and resources and the teens and families love it. So it's all about just thinking outside the box and kind of transforming your library, so to speak. Thank you so much. Well, I just wanted to say we are, can we take one more question and then we'll have to, um, we'll have to shut it down. But I, I do want to take, if someone has one more question or one last thing, I would like to encourage that. Hello, this is Donald Peoples. I'm, I'm an adult librarian from Brooklyn Public Library. What's up, Andrew? What's up, Eugene? And to the other um, brothers on the, um, on the panel um, and, the, um, and the sisters um, as well in this, um, in this event. Um, my question is, um, outside of work, oh, and um, also Juana, um, Juana, I see you there. Um, my question for y'all is, outside of work, do y'all walk around with books in your hands to show people in the community that Black men do read? Um, because I, I, I do that all the time. I'm on public transportation, reading all the time, or if I'm in Dollar Tree or different places where I go to and the, um, the different shenanigans are happening and I don't wanna get involved. I just always have a book. So do y'all do y'all um, always show people that y'all are readers? And what is the response that y'all get as black men reading books? Yes. I'm especially when I have to be in line for anything. If I'm in line more than two minutes, the first thing I do is pull out a book. Go ahead, Shannon. You can finish. Go ahead, Siku. Oh, I'm always carrying books. I carry at least two books with me at any one time. I love reading uh, Walter Dean Myers books. Walter Mosley and Eric Jerome Dickey are my two favorite black, popular black authors. So I'm always got their books. And then there's always the third one, which is always anything on black history because I'm always doing, doing research. So yes. I would say I don't walk away, I walk around per se with books, but since I live in Miami, I'm always hanging out. So I'm talking to people. And you know, one of the first questions people always ask you, what do you do for a living? And once I tell them now I'm a librarian, people are intrigued and people want to know what do I read and stuff like that. And I tell them, you know, I may not be reading an adult book, but I always read some children's books. So, um, and a lot of people, 
you know, with me, me promoting my, my platform, they know local authors, you know, I'm like, well, if you got to know a local author, send them my way. So, you know, just starting a conversation with random people just been the way I promote, you know, saying librarianship. Yeah, I, I wouldn't say that I walk around with books uh, all the time. Uh, if I'm reading something um, that, that I can hold, it's probably going to be a comic book. I love comic books. Um, I love to listen to books. I love, I love, uh, I'm a storyteller, so I love to listen to stories. I love to hear stories. Um, and, you know, again, that's another way that we can um, get our children to understand that, you know, listening to stories is reading a book as well. Although my, my son's kind of <laughs> kind of take advantage of that. <laughs> like, no, you need to pick up a book sometime. <laughs> but but yeah, I mean, so I, I love to listen to a book. Um, and if I have something in my hands, it's probably gonna be like a comic book or something. I, 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 oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. No, I was gonna say, we'll let you have the last word. Go ahead, sir. Sure, thank you. Now I was gonna say, I, don't, I also don't, well, I don't walk around with books all the time, but um, now that the pandemic is slowly starting to be at least in some control for a good, for a good portion of us, um, I started going, I'm a beer drinker, so I go to more uh, breweries and I'll read a book or so for an hour at the, at the table or at the counter and people will see me and they'll just appreciate it. They end up sitting down and talking to me, asking what I'm reading. Um, they find out that I am a librarian, what I would recommend. Um, and then I also have a Arthur Reed um, library card tattoo on my arm that's very visible almost all the time. So people, so people will see that and they'll be like, is that an actual library card? Um, so it's a great talking point. So I think just being having a walking library card on me at all times is a great way for people to know who I am and know what the library is all about. I wanted us to thank everybody for coming today and participating in this and sharing in this moment. I would love to keep the conversation going just in the future with anything. We have a listserv on our We Are Here lit website. Please join and let's start talking about books, research education, curriculum, all this stuff. Let's get on here and, and continue the conversation so we can focus on literacy for these um, Black boys and young Black men and and and, and collaborate more and, and, and those type of things. So again, I want to thank my panelists. I want to thank you all for coming. And this will be available on our social media websites if you want to see it again. So y'all have a good evening and we appreciate you so much for coming out. Y'all take care. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the golden opportunity. Man, I can't Thank wait to watch so this. Again. Thank <laughs> y'all for having me. Thank you. I appreciate it. Y'all were so good. Oh my gosh. This it's just gonna be impactful because it's gonna sit there and some kids gonna see it. You know, like and some somebody's gonna clip it and use it in research or something like that. So what you what you're doing is is meaningful. So thank you so much. Just mm -hmm. like Michael, I'm gonna have me a beer too, man. <laughs> hey, it's five o'clock everywhere. You're good to go. <laughs> All right. Thank you. I'm gonna shut it down. Right. So take care, y'all. Take care. Bye, right, AJ. See you later. Man. All right, take it easy, my G.